Today, when is a test not a test? Hello again, I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to our latest post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. In APRA's Wayne Byers speech yesterday, the one in which he said an 8% growth in residential home lending was healthy, he also covered the stress testing processes with the banks and gave them a clean bill of health. So that's all right then. While 40 billion of losses were suggested in the bank's mortgage book, this was, he said, manageable. Today, LF Economics posted their own bank's testing analysis, putting APRA's stress test to the test. I'll put a link in the comments section below. And they applied the APRA stress parameters to the data from Westpac, which was revealed in the recent Royal Commission hearings. Using that data, they extrapolated losses to the banking system if scaled up to be $298 billion, a quantum larger than APRA's. Now, we ran our own scenarios using our core market model and using the same APRA worst case baseline. And we get a result much closer to the LF economic scenarios than the APRA outcomes. And in fact, we think the LF economics numbers may themselves be conservative. In addition, from APRA, we get no detail on their work and no individual bank level disclosure, unlike the US version. See our recent post on the US, testing, testing, one, two, $568 billion. So we do not find the APRA version very credible, which is a worry. Clearly, their strategy is to just trust us, just as they did with the now revealed poor lending practices. To summarize, the tests are first, a downturn in China and a collapse in demand for commodities. Second, the subsequent downgrade in sovereign and bank debt ratings, leading to a temporary closure of offshore funding markets. Next, a sell-off on the Australian dollar and widening credit spreads. And as a result, Australian GDP falls by 4%, unemployment doubles to 11%, and house prices decline by 35% nationally over three years. So, pretty severe. And in addition, banks had to consider an operational risk-loss event, including misconduct and mis-selling in the origination of residential mortgages. The additional operational risk element served as an amplifier, they said, of the stress, adding a further shock to bank balance sheets. APRA says this results in a reduction in bank capital and credit losses of around $40 billion on their residential mortgage books. What have they assumed about property sales in default, we wonder? And what about claims on lenders' mortgage insurers at an industry level? In addition, APRA does not really give us much detail of the scenarios. Compare this again with the US version. Is it a short, sharp shock or a longer grind? We suspect the former. Now, if we run the same scenario through our core market model, based on a household service, what happens? Well, first, if banks cannot fund their books from offshore markets, their ability to lend in aggregate drops by around 30%, unless it can be supplemented by either more deposits or local investors. Remember, a significant proportion of the non-deposit part of banks' books are funded short-term, so the impact will be immediate. Either way, there will be a rationing of credit and a bid up on the price of funds, so putting more pressure on margins and mortgage rates. The local market's ability to provide sufficient funding is suspect, and it is likely that the government via the RBA would have to provide funding, perhaps by way of purchase of existing loan portfolios. We doubt the lender's ability to access funding, and therefore loans will be rationed. Households who are unemployed will be unable to continue to pay their mortgages and will likely default. We have to assume that specific segments of the market will be the most impacted, and we can run analysis on this. In addition, some households renting will be unable to pay their rents as they fall due, putting some investment properties under pressure. We estimate that around 15% of mortgage holders will default, and we assume that banks will try to assist borrowers via their hardship schemes and capitalising interest for a period rather than foreclosing 
because selling in a falling market just creates more losses. So over the scenario time frame, using our data, we think credit losses will be north of $310 billion. This compared with the $40 billion in the APRA result and the $298 billion from LF Economics. So why the differences? Well, first, we think bank funding costs will be higher thanks to the network effect of all lenders trying to tap limited sources, thus driving rates still higher. APRA appears to have looked at banks individually. Second, we think more households will be exposed to default risks as unemployment bites. And in addition, we think that those remaining in employment will have less overtime and no wage growth, so there will be more financial pressure. Third, the loan-to-value and debt-to-income ratios in our data, which are based on our up-to-date survey data, suggest that the risks in the portfolio are actually higher than those used in the APRA bank source modelling. Some of this is so-called liar loans, and the rest is multiple debt exposures and changed circumstances. Currently, we think banks are myopic on this. Fourth, lender mortgage insurers will not be able to meet all claims. We're not sure what APRAs or the banks assumed. LMIs may be one point, and perhaps the first point, of failure. But overall, this does not give me much assurance that the banking sector is in fine fettle and that there are no risks from the excessive mortgage binge. APRA will need to do better to alleviate my concerns. As always, if you like what you've seen here today, please like the post and add a comment or question. I do read them all. And if you want to join the growing band of subscribers who receive alerts when we release new posts, do subscribe now by hitting that subscribe bell. And if you've already subscribed, many thanks. I really appreciate your support and participation. And if you value the content we produce, please do consider joining our Patreon program, where you can support our ability to continue to make great content. And here is the link. I'm Martin North, the Principal Analyst of Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.